Okay, it's, it's good to see all of you tonight. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's a real pleasure to have with us Herb Kennan, who is a senior contributing editor and analyst uh, for the Jerusalem Post. He writes extensively on diplomacy, politics, and Israeli society. Uh, and he's been at the paper for 35 years. And over the last two decades, he's been there as a diplomatic correspondent. Um, and throughout his time at the paper, he's covered a number of the major stories that have really shaped uh, the state of Israel over the last several decades, from the uh, intifada to disengagement, uh, to the immigration of Soviet Jewry. Uh, he, these are all events uh, of, enor of enormous import that, uh, that he's covered. Um, and it, he doesn't know just write about these uh, heavy issues. He also writes a, a light column on what life is like uh, uh, in Israel. Uh, and that a collection of those columns was, was, uh, was published under the title French Fries in a Pita uh, in 2014. So you can look up that book. Uh, and we know that he has a, a family connection to our shul as well. Um, originally he's from uh, Denver uh, and has a BA uh, from the University of Colorado Boulder and an MA in journalism from the University of Illinois uh, Champaign-Urbana. So I'll hand things over uh, to, uh, to you Herb and then we'll take uh, questions at the end. If questions come to you, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat at any time, and then I'll pose them uh, at the end. Okay, uh, I'm unmuted. You can hear me? Yep, okay. <clears throat> First of all, good evening. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's two in the morning here, and I generally uh, walk around my house at two in the morning with a, with a jacket and a tie. We, we run a very formal ship here in, uh, in Mali Adumim, where I live. Um, listen, as, as the rabbi said, what I want to talk about uh, now for the next few minutes is four Israeli elections in two years. We're going to our fourth election on March 23rd. Why is this happening? What's going to be and what does it mean for the country? Um, let me just start by saying that, I mean, you guys over there, you just came out of an election cycle yourself. You know, how fun was that? How great was that? How would you like to do that every two years, every two years and three months, which is essentially how often we've been going to elections, national elections in this country since 1996, every two years and three months. And it's not as if our elections are a veritable love fest, right? They're not, they cause as much discord and disunity over here as the elections do, of course, in America. Uh, we're gonna see this now in the upcoming elections where the whole issue of the ultra-Orthodox, the Haredim, and whether or not they should or they shouldn't or they are or they're not abiding by the, the COVID regulations, that's gonna be a huge issue. It's gonna cause a lot of discord and disunity. Now in retrospect, an election every two years and three months for us ain't bad because like I said, we're facing our fourth election now in two years, that's an election every six months. Um, it's like Israel turning into Italy, right? If you remember, I remember growing up, Italy was like, like a byword for political instability. Uh, in fact, since 1945, I think Italy has had something like 69 different governments in 75 years. By comparison to Italy, we're still a little rock of stability, having only had 35 governments since 1948. But 35 governments is a lot right, in, in 75 years, compared to the U.S., which during that same period has only had 13 presidents. I think Biden now is the 14th. So 35 different governments going to elections 35 times, that's a lot. Why does it matter? It matters because it militates against stability, right? And stability, consistency, and policy is something that's very important. And in our region, it's extremely important. It's vital. We need to plan. We need to have the ability to plan for the long term. We need to have a government that can last more than half a year in order to plan. And unfortunately, right now, we don't have that. And that's, that's something that's, uh, that, that's, that's, that's not good. That's a negative. To understand why this is happening, why we have this political instability, it's important, I think, to look and see how Israel's political landscape has shifted dramatically over the last 20 to 30 years, right? Remember 1992, go back 1992, which was 29 years ago, Bill Clinton beat George Bush in the US election. Seems like a long time ago, but it wasn't really, right? 
that same year Yitzhak Rabin beat, beat Yitzhak Shamir in our election, right? In that election, 1992, the traditional Israeli left wing, the Labor Party, right, and its satellite party merits, they won 56 seats in the 120 seat Knesset. You only need 61 for a majority. They almost had it on their own, right? In the last election, in March 2020, those same two left wing, center left and left wing parties running together won six seats. That means that from 1992, 56 to six, they lost 90% of their power in 30 years. That's a political realignment. Now, what's happening now is, according to the polls, the Labor Party, right, the party of David Ben-Gurion, the party of Golda Meir, will not even get into the Knesset next time unless it forms, uh, it, 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 it unites with some smaller party. That's a colossal, a colossal change. And it means that the traditional right-left split in this country no longer exists. The country has gone from being a center-left uh, uh, country, which was the case up until 1977, to becoming a center-right country. And when you look at what's going to happen now between the U.S. and Israel, you've got to remember, in, in America now, you're going to have a government that's center-left. In Israel, you're going to have a government that's center-right. As a result of that different worldview, you're probably going to see some friction. I'll get to that in a minute. But what happened? What happened in Israel that the country's political landscape shifted so dramatically over the last three decades? I think three things, three things have happened. The first has been is, is that there has been tremendous demographic changes, right? The second is the second intifada. Remember the second intifada, that four and a half year of uh, years of of terrorism of unrelenting mind-numbing terrorism and the third thing that happened i think that changed things was the withdrawal from the gaza strip in 2005 and how that impacted on israelis view of reality regarding the demographics the country's population ballooned in the 1990s thanks to the massive immigration from the soviet union also some immigration from ethiopia in a decade, the country's population grew by 40%, right? From 4.5 million in 1990 to 6.3 million in 2000. Today, we stand at over 9 million. That's an incredible demographic shift. And these Russian immigrants and these Ethiopian immigrants, they're not voting for the left, right? They're not coming from that traditional left-wing socialist Zionist milieu. They ain't there, right? So that was a big change. Also, the religious population. The, the, the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox, as well as the, the religious Zionists, right? their populations, because the, the, they generally have more kids than the secular public, right, is growing. Although the secular Israelis have kids too, right? I mean, the, it, it's, it's a, this, is, this is a country where everybody has kids, but just the religious population is outstripping the non-religious population because of, because of birth rates. Um, so you have major demographic changes in the religious population, both the ultra-Orthodox, the Haredim, and the national religious, they don't generally tack towards the left, right? They generally, generally are going to vote for the right. The second change that, that brought about, or the second reason for this dramatic uh, political change is realignment, is the second intifada. The second intifada fundamentally changed the country. Right, those four years of mind-wrenching terrorism when it was a chore to get your kids to go downtown and get a falafel because you're afraid that something would happen on the bus, that period changed the country's mentality. Right, The country was mugged by reality there, and the reality there was extremely difficult. Israel has not had a left-wing prime minister since Ehud Barak in 1999, the year before the Intifada. Right? Haven't had a left-wing prime minister since then. Uh, the Intifada came after Israel offered Yasser Arafat an incredibly generous offer that he turned down. And after turning it down, he launched the Intifada. And that pretty much did in the idea that the left was trying to inculcate the country with that if you just give up territories or show a willingness to give up territories, peace would flow. What we saw from the second Intifada um, Ehud Barak was willing to give up a tremendous amount of territories, 95% of the territories, splitting Jerusalem, dividing Jerusalem, right? But instead of giving us 
the peace that we longed for, it brought on the worst terror, terrorism that we've ever faced with about over, over 1,000 Israelis being killed during that four year period. That period changed the country's mentality. It has a huge impact on how the country looks at the possibilities with the Palestinians. And any lingering doubts were put to rest in the aftermath of the Gaza withdrawal in 2005. Remember, this was a huge, huge traumatic experience for Israel. When it left the settlements in Gaza, did what the world wanted to do, left the settlements, pulled 10,000 Jews out of their homes in Gaza, didn't bring peace, brought Hamas to power and the worst terrorism that the country ever faced, right? So as a result of those three things, dramatic three things, the change of demography, demography, the second intifada and the Gaza withdrawal, the traditional fault lines in Israeli society over the territories uh, and the Palestinians started to change as the left in the traditional sense of the word was kind of erased, right? The left wing was erased. Nobody believed that we could reach this, this, this long for peace right now with the Palestinians. Now, there's much talk abroad about a two-state solution, but I mean, you had it today at the United Nations where the, the Biden, uh, the, the first representative for the U.S. speaking after Biden's, uh, uh, after Biden was sworn into office, started talking again about the two-state solution. In Israel, most people don't think that that realistically is in the offing, even of those, even those who want or, or, or are interested in it, right, who want to see it. They don't believe that given the leadership right now on, on either side, especially on the other side, it's something that's realistic. So the right left lines, traditional lines have been blurred because the left to a large extent has been erased. Right? So when you talk about right, left in Israel, the left is pretty much no longer there. As a result, a new fault line emerged in Israeli politics. And that new fault line has a name and the name is Bibi Netanyahu. Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister. If in the past, 20, 25 years ago, one could say that roughly half the country was for settlements and half against, half for conceding land for peace and half opposed, today that half and half split isn't over those issues. It's over Netanyahu. It's whether he's a saint or a scoundrel, whether he's a savior or someone who must be removed to save the country, right? And the last three elections in this country were essentially about one thing and one thing only, Bibi Netanyahu, right? They were all referendums on Netanyahu and they were all inconclusive. And this election, the one that we're facing now in a couple of weeks time or in a month and a half, March 23rd, right? That one ain't gonna be, I think that much different. Which makes things kind of confusing when looking at Israeli politics today because over the last two decades, to understand politics, you had to understand the blocks, right? Whichever block was larger, the right or the left, would be the block that would govern. And the blocks were pretty much split along traditional, traditional lines. Uh, you had the Likud and the Haredi parties and the religious Zionist parties and uh, a Victor Lieberman with an immigrant party, with a Russian immigrant party. Those were on the right. That was the right wing block. And on the left, you had labor, merits, the Arab parties, and various flavor of the month center left parties that emerged from time to time. Lieberman ruined that, right, all in 2019. He was the member, a member of, he was a member of, deep right member of the right wing bloc. But in 2019, in the first election during the cycle that we're now in, now in he refused to join a government with Netanyahu. He threw us into the spiral of unending elections, and he also confused that right-left uh, uh, right split. So today you can't speak about right-left blocks. You only speak about a pro bb and an anti bb block, right? When doing the coalition math to see how the parties can, can come up with the 61 members in the Knesset to form a majority and form a government, um, you don't look at the parties on regarding where they, where, they, where they stand on the Palestinian issue or on the settlements, you look at whether they will be willing to sit with Netanyahu in a government or not. And right now, it's not completely clear if that will happen. I'll give you an example. A poll last week on one of the major television stations 
put the anti-Netanyahu block at 62 seats, the pro-Netanyahu block at 45 seats, and 13 seats somewhere in the middle, right? But that's how people now are talking about things. It's not right, left, settlements, Palestinians. It's pro bb or anti bb And what makes this so confusing sometimes is that some of those in the anti bb block, right, some are on the left and some are on the right. Some are on the left on the Palestinian issue and some are on the right on the Palestinian issue. And even though they're all united by a deep distaste for Netanyahu, there are enough other issues out there, right, that I think will separate them and will kind of make it difficult for all those different parties to cooperate. For instance, a name that you want to keep in mind is a guy named Gidon Saar, right? He's a former Likud minister. He's now the head of a new party called the New Hope, which is right now posing the greatest challenge to Netanyahu. Um, he split from the Likud because he said that Netanyahu is corrupt and he can't be prime minister, right? Can he cooperate and form a government with Arab MKs who don't think that Israel should exist as a Jewish state? Right? That'll be kind of difficult. It's hard to believe. It's hard to believe that a dislike for Netanyahu is enough cement to keep these disparate parties inside the anti bb bloc together. Um, there's actually something I think or I find, and I've been covering this stuff for a long time, I find rather sad about this whole state of affairs. And that's that because the fault lines are no longer at all about ideology or policies, they're only about personalities. It's all about personality right now. There's no, there's no, there's no party conventions discussing ideology and, and, and long-term planning. It's all about the man. It's all about the person, right? If you look at Guidon Saar, the guy I just spoke about, again, he came out of the Likud. He doesn't disagree with the Likud, mainstream Likud on anything except whether or not Netanyahu should remain or should be removed. There's another party on the right, Yamina, Naftali Benny, Naftali Bennett, national religious guy. There's no real difference between him and Gidon Saar uh, as far as policies. Right? So why don't those two parties get together? Because they can't agree who can be number one. They're no longer party platforms and conferences. It's all about the personalities. And I guess when you have a prime minister like we have right now, Netanyahu, who's been in power consecutively for 12 years, and who's been in power in Israel, he's been the prime minister of Israel for 15 years of the country's entire history. 15 years. Now think about that. Israel's only been in existence for 72 years. He's been prime minister for 15 years. He's been prime minister longer than Ben-Gurion, by far longer than Ben-Gurion now, right? 15 years, that's 20% 20, 20 of the country's history. We've been governed by one prime minister. It's like in America, right, having one president for 49 years. Okay? I mean, imagine, imagine how much fun that would be. Imagine Trump or Biden or Obama or anybody for 49 years. Um, so that's, that's how the lay of the land here politically has changed. What does it mean? What will be? What's going to come of this right now? As the poll I cited above indicates, this election very well could be inconclusive again, as the previous three were. Uh, it is possible that we could even go to a fifth election, right? That's not something be, to be discounted. And the one thing that could really uh, remove this logjam or clear the way would be for Netanyahu, for Bibi to voluntarily step down, okay? But he won't, he won't. He's not gonna do that. Why not? Basically for two reasons. First of all, and I say this after covering him for a decade, I think Netanyahu genuinely believes that he is the only guy capable and able at this time to lead Israel in the challenges that it faces, right? Netanyahu, I think, genuinely seems to believe that he was somehow touched by his destiny to lead the country at this time with Iran threatening and that nobody else can do the job. I just finished reading a big biography on Churchill and Churchill had this other, this, it, it, it's called Walking with Destiny. And he had this, he also had this idea that, that only he could leave Britain or he was destined to leave Britain during, the, during World War II. I think Netanyahu feels that he was destined to lead Israel as it faces the Iranian challenge. He believes that he's uniquely equipped, that Israel needs him or could face doom, that no one else, like I said, will be able to stand up to Iran or to Biden or to the Americans if they start to pressure Israel. 
The other reason why Bibi is not going to step down is because he genuinely believes that the elites are out to get him, that the left, because it was unable for so long to defeat him at the ballot box, right, uh, have figured out that the only way they can remove him through uh, remove him was through legal means. And as the polling shows, his base, his base of support, and he has a strong base of support, believes that he has a base of of between 28 to 32 seats that are standing by him come thick or thin. I think it's important to, to, to realize Bibi will win these elections, meaning that his party will be the biggest party. The question is, will he be able to cobble other parties together and form a coalition? That's something that it's difficult to say right now where they can do. The idea that, the idea, like I said, his base believes that, that you know, they, they back him thick and thin and one of the reasons, I think, a couple of the reasons they, they, they believe this is because they believe that the indictments, right, he's been indicted on three different cases uh, for bribery, for, for fraud, for breach of trust. His base believes that, that those corruption charges are flimsy, right? Uh, is it a crime, really, for the prime minister to use his influence to get, to get positive media coverage, which is one of the, one of the cases up against him? Um, the base also believes he's, he's, he's innocent because they see that there were problematic tactics used in turning people into state witnesses against him. Uh, there's been problematic behavior by some like the attorney general involved in the case. And all that is Lee led his base, which is strong, which is very strong to believe that, you know what? Um, Netanyahu's claims that people are out to get him, that they can't remove him through the ballot box only in the courts. There's something to it. It's difficult definitively to say, but there are certain elements at play now in the upcoming election that we haven't seen in the past, right? Certain things at work in this election that we haven't seen in the past three elections. The first is that Bibi for the first time, and I, seriously for the first time, is facing challenges from the right, from his right. Kidon Sar, Naftali Bennett are on his right. It's one thing for those on the left to say that Netanyahu needs to go, right? It's another thing when those voices are coming from the right, from, from his right. And it's, it's one thing for the left to say that his decisions are not guided by national interests, but rather what's going to help him wiggle out of these, of these cases against him. But it's another thing if that argument is coming from the right, from people like Gidon Saar, who used to be in his party, and from a former close confidant who split and joined with Sar named Zev Elkin. That's different altogether. That's just a different feeling. It's a different atmosphere. Another different difference in this election, in the upcoming election, is that there won't be any Donald Trump out there, right? Uh, in the past three elections, Trump actively campaigned for Netanyahu, and his close relationship, Netanyahu's close relationship with Trump, is something that he played up in the election campaign. Uh, that won't be the case this time. I mean, remember, in the first election, back in March of 2019, April of 2019, right before that election, Trump, in order to boost Netanyahu's chances, came out and said that the U.S. would recognize Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. That was a big thing a couple of weeks before the election. In the last election, just about, you know, uh, about a month before the election, he came out with the deal of the century. He rolled out the deal of the century, which is the best plan for Israel that's ever been presented by a president. Again, not coincidence that this happened so close to the elections. Um, it's not going to happen this time. It's not going to happen this time. Also, Netanyahu will not be playing up his relationship with Trump in this election as he has in the past because it could possibly boomerang. Okay, I mean, his opponents especially after the events that happened in the Capitol earlier this month in Washington, they're going to be saying that Netanyahu aligned Israel too closely to Trump and that anything that Trump touched is tainted, right? After what happened in Washington, anything Trump touched is tainted. As a result, Israel is tainted in the eyes of many. That's bad. They could use that in the campaign against Netanyahu. A big say selling point, right, for Netanyahu in the past three elections has been the good ties with the world's leaders, with, with Trump, with, with Putin and Russia, right, with India's Modi, with, with Brazil's Bolsonaro. These are things that he played up during the last campaign. Um, I'm not sure he's going to play it up to the same extent this time because not sure that Trump, 
the closest with Trump is going to be a political uh, asset in the campaign, it might in fact even be even be a liability. Tellingly, right, he took a picture of himself and Trump together off the banner of his Facebook page, replaced instead by him getting the coronavirus vaccine. Right, that's the that's the main picture on his page right now. Uh, one thing he's likely to do, however, during the campaign is to say that precisely now, right, at a time when when you have a Democratic administration, Biden coming into power, and many of the national security hands under the Obama administration coming back into 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 power and wanting to re-enter the Iranian nuclear deal, he'll say that precisely now you're going to need somebody like me, like Netanyahu, to be able to stand up to Biden like I did to Obama and say, no, we can't do this. Uh, some are asking now whether, however, on the reverse, the other side of the coin, with Biden about to move into the, in, into the White House, might Israelis look at what's going on in Washington and say, hey, this is the time to get rid of Bibi because we want a prime minister who will be able to work well with the American president, right? We want to turn the leaf with the new administration and no better way to turn a leaf would be than to get Netanyahu out of power. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think I don't think Israelis vote that strategically. Israelis have a million issues on their head right now, domestic issues. They're not going to go to the ballot box and think, well, if, if I vote out Netanyahu, we're going to have better relations with the U.S. They're not going to go down to that resolution. Another major difference in the election this time, other than the past three elections we've had, is, of course, Corona, right, COVID. When Israel went to the ballot box last time, on March 2nd, uh, in 2020, Corona has only been on our shores for about 10 days. Lockdown, capsules, the Zoom mega boom, that was all stuff of the future, right? Coronavir coronavirus played no part at all in the last three elections. This time, it's going to have a starring role, and not because it will, will be an endless point of debate with Netanyahu saying that Israel vaccinated now at a faster rate than any other country in the world will emerge first from the crisis because of the, because of the sagacious decisions that he made. Uh, and all the other parties, except for the Haredim, saying that his handling of the crisis was an abysmal failure and totally inept. Right? You're going to have that debate like you had in America during the campaign. It will emerge as an issue because tens of thousands of people in this country who did not have to worry about their financial stability when we went to the elections last March do have to worry about it today, something that will likely impact on how they vote. And this is something that's unique in Israel, right? Worrying about voting on financial economic issues because that's generally not how Israelis vote. Israelis, unlike in America, generally don't vote on the economy. What was it, what Bill Clinton said, the economy is stupid. That's not how Israelis traditionally have voted. It's traditionally been on security, diplomatic issues, right? The Palestinians, the territories, uh, terrorism. But now those issues have been taken over to a large degree by the economic ones caused by COVID. Uh, Israel's success in rolling out the vaccine, and Netanyahu's done a good job in that, and his hand in getting the vaccine and procuring the vaccine. Right? I just today or yesterday, I got my second vaccination. Uh, I know my family members in, 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 in the States are still waiting to get their first. Um, that will undoubtedly rebound re to his favor in the polls. It's actually it's uncanny how the inoculation of most of the country's population is expected to be done by March 23rd, the date of the election. Right? And I mean, just think of this, like if Trump just missed the announcement of the rollout of the vaccination by two weeks, right, um, Netanyahu by some, you know, by some fortunate coincidence, um, he's going he's gonna to be able to, to say pretty much when we go to the polls, look, it, it's, it's behind us now because of the vaccination. Um, however, is that going to be enough? I think, again, people who are suffering financially, they're likely to take it out on the party in power. We've seen this all across the world. Uh, look what happened in the U.S., where the virus most definitely had an impact on, on, on Trump's defeat. The virus will also have an impact on the election in that was it's going to in another way, and that is it's going to impact on on Netanyahu's ability to have rallies. He's not going to be able to have big rallies like he did last time. Netanyahu is a consummate politician. He's great at glad handing. He's great at meeting with people. He's great at rallies. Right? COVID is going to make that impossible. 
to a certain extent, right, this is similar to what happened with Trump in the U.S. as well. Uh, one last thing that's different this time in this election, this is something that could redound favorably for Netanyahu, is you're seeing a fascinating trend in the Arab sector, right? In Israel, among Israelis, Israel's Arab population. Israel has 21% Arabs, right? In the last election, they voted predominantly for a, for a, for a party called the United List, which is a, a hard left party which, with, with, with many members who question whether or not Israel should exist as a Jewish country, right? Um, Netanyahu has this reputation born to a large extent from saying a few election cycles again uh, ago that the Arabs were, 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 were flocking to the polls. We have to come out and vote. He's got this kind of reputation of, of being a, a, a racist, right? I, I don't think the reputation is, is justified, but to a certain degree, that's his reputation. Not as somebody whom the Arab population looks to as somebody they could vote for. The polls are showing that the Likud could win two seats, among the Arab population. Now, two seats doesn't sound like much, but if they do, that could shift the whole balance of the future government. And it's fascinating what's happened in the in, in Arab population, right? And I think to a certain extent, this has to do with the accords that Israel has signed with the United Arab Emirates, with Bahrain, with Sudan, with Morocco, right? Those accords were signed with Netanyahu. So if, if Bahrain and the UAE can deal with Netanyahu, are the Arab voters going to say we can't, right? The Arab voters are starting to say, hey, we have to worry about our interests, not only the Palestinians. We have to get we have to get what's good for our constituency. And it's not good for our constituency to be left outside the corridors of power, which we are because of the stridently anti-Israel rhetoric of our leaders. So they're, try they're starting to change. And we saw this, I think it, 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 it was best illustrated in, uh, in September when the Accord, the peace agreement with the UAE was brought to the Knesset, and the Arab list, the, the joint list, the Arab party voted against it. Right? Here's an accord, a peace agreement with the Arab countries, and the Arabs in Israel, the, their representatives voted against it. And by doing so, I think they, the Arab parties, they created a, a chasm between themselves and the, their constituents. Because for most Arab constituents, that agreement is a blessing. Why is it a blessing? Because it creates for them all kinds of employment opportunities, all kinds of business opportunities, right? They stand to benefit more than anybody else by these accords. Why? Because if you're a UAE businessman wanting to come to do business in Israel, you're going to want somebody who can speak both Arabic and Hebrew to help you out, right? And they can do it. And also going the other way. Israeli companies wanting to set up in Bahrain are going to turn to the Israeli Arabs. It opens up all kinds of venues for them. The Arab list voted against it. And I think the polls showing that the Arab list is going to drop from maybe 15 seats to 10 seats, with Likud picking up two of those, I think that's a, a manifestation of the, of the discontent among the Arabs, the, the Arab population, to how the representatives voted. Uh, what does this all mean for Israel, this, this whole scenario, this, this instability? Look, as I said in the beginning, instability is bad. It sends a, a bad message to the region and to the country's enemies. Uh, that being said, I think the recent Abraham Accords, right, those accords with the UAE, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco, they're not going to be affected by this political instability. Those accords, to a large extent, were brokered not by Jerusalem, but rather by Washington. So what happens in Jerusalem, as far as politically, is not going to have that much an effect on them. The more important thing in, 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 in wondering what's going to be the future of these accords is not who's going to be the prime minister in Israel necessarily, but whether the U.S. under Biden is going to honor commitments to the United Arab Emirates to sell them F-35, to Sudan to take them off the terror list, to Morocco regarding recognizing their sovereignty over the Western Sahara. Those are things that America promised those countries in return for signing these agreements with Israel, right? If the U.S. reverses ground there, right, which I don't think is going to happen, but that would have more an impact on those accords than any political changes or instability that's happening right now in Jerusalem. Let, let, me just, let me just end up here now, and then I'll take some questions, by saying one thing about Biden and the Middle East. There may be a tendency now in this administration, especially following what happened in the Capitol, to want to reverse everything Trump did because Trump did it. 
right? The idea that, that anything he touched is now, is now pasul, is now tainted, so we have to reverse it. But in the Middle East, I think that would be a big mistake, right? Trump, through these accords, fundamentally changed the parameters in the Middle East. It's a different region right now than it was uh, four or five years ago. That's a good thing. That's a positive change. And it's something that Biden, even though he's going to be repulsed by anything that Trump did, that's what Biden has to look at. He's going to say, look, this is good. This is a, a firm foundation, changes the parameters in the Middle East. It can move us forward. And this is something that needs to be moved forward, not undone. So I think that's, that's from our perspective in Israel, that's something that we're looking at very carefully regarding where Biden goes taking us forward. So let me, let me end there uh, and then just take any questions on that or anything else you might want to ask about what's going on over here. Thank you. Rabbi, you want to deal with the questions? Sure. So if people can put the questions they have, I see we have one question already in the chat. Uh, if you have any, if you have questions, please post them in the chat uh, and then I'll, uh, I'll pose them to, uh, to our guests. Uh, just one question I have to sort of, to begin with, you mentioned how economic issues are playing a larger role uh, in this election they have in the past. Uh, and, that, and already, I think a few years ago, some of the, as the left-wing parties recognized that the public no longer was interested necessarily, no longer believed what they were saying about uh, the possibility of a two-state solution, they moved and tried to sort of run on more economic issues. And there were protests sort of similar to our, our Occupy Wall Street protests that happened about high rents in Tel Aviv and things like that. Voters who are interested and concerned about economic issues. Which, are there any parties that are running explicitly on that in this election? Um, look, there is one party. It's a new party uh, founded by a former head uh, of one of the big departments in, in the Treasury Ministry that he's running on this. I, it, it's not that's the only party that's, that's waving this as the banner, but it, it will be incorporated into all the parties' platforms to a degree that it hasn't been in the past. Like, I mean, I mean you mentioned something interesting. You said, like, you had these. These, you had the, the, it was called the cottage cheese protests back in 2011, protested, you know, the, the, the cost of living in, in, in Israel was just, you know, out of sight and you had to do something about it. And even with that, even with that, the, the, even with those protests, Netanyahu won the, the election two years later in 2013. And I think the reason for that and the reason why Netanyahu continues to win, like I said, he's been prime minister for 15, 15 years. And the reason, with all this stuff over his head, right? I mean, the country knows about all this, and they yet continue to vote him in time and time and time again. The reason for that is one re one major reason, and that is security. What he's been able to do is project the sense that when he's in power, your kids are safer. When he's in power, terrorism is low. When he's in power, he's not going to bring you to war. And the truth is that the, 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 the figures bear this out, right? This year was the lowest level of terrorism this country has had since 1962, right? That's incredible. It's incredible in that many of us, right, remember what it was like here from 2000 to 2005. In the, in, in, in the, in the 11 years since, or the 12 years now, that, that Netanyahu is, uh, has been in power consecutively from 2009 to 2020, there's been an average of about 16 Israelis killed each year. Right. Last year was two, again, lowest level since 62, but that, that, 16. In the nine years beforehand, from 2000 to 2009, an average of 120 Israelis were being killed each year. So you got 120 versus 16. Now you can say, well, that's not a fair comparison because your comparison relative quiet to the Intifada, which is horrible. So you can say, okay, the Seder. So let's look at his first term in office from 96 to 99. During that period, 22 Israelis were killed average each year in terrorism. In the three years previous under Rabin in Paris, an average of 56 Israelis were killed. So you have 56 versus 22. You got 16 versus 120. Israelis don't have those finger, her figures at their fingertips, but it's something they felt in their gut, right? They got that. So that's that sense that this man can provide us with security is what would, 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 would allow him to win time and time and time again, um, despite everything you know, everything out there, despite despite uh, the, the, the corruption charges, despite everything. Um, this time, with the country, again, not facing any real huge, the people not feeling a, a great degree, degree of personal insecurity, they're going to be looking at other issues, right? 
And the issue that's causing them the most insecurity now, it's not physical insecurity, it's financial insecurity, like, 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 like in the US, like everywhere. So, so this is something that I think is going to be, you know, major on their minds this time that we haven't seen in the past, even during that time of the cottage cheese revolution, when people were still worried about the terrorism much more than they are today. Okay, now we have a, a bunch of questions that have come in. So um, just to begin, there was a question about how coalition agreements work. And what does that mean? Because even a lot of other parliamentary democracies, coalition agreements aren't always that common. So it's a not not a unique feature, but one of uh, not a feature certainly that of of Israeli democracy that's different. Right. Okay. So so we're a parliamentary democracy, which means we have 120 seats in the Knesset. In order to govern, right, you need a coalition of 61 parties. Uh, for the last half a half a century, no one party is able to reach that number, 61. So they have to form with smaller parties to reach that number, right? Uh, it used to be like, like you had the coup and labor, they would get you know, into the 50s and they would form with one or two smaller parties and they'd form a government. Now, what we see is that the labor and the coup, they don't get 50 anymore, they get 30 or 35 or 29. So they have to form with more smaller parties in order to form a coalition. Now, these parties are coming from different ideological places. Likud, Netanyahu, since 1977, his, his natural uh, a partner to form a coalition has, has been the Haredim, has been the religious parties, right? Um, the religious parties have pretty much said to the Likud, we will give you an open slate to deal with the big diplomatic security issues, right, that are important to you. Just don't touch the issues that are important to us, right? Don't touch Shabbat, don't touch the Western Wall, don't touch marriage and conversion, and we'll live together. And that's essentially the, what's happened, right? The, 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 that's been, that's been the, 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 the basis of the coalition to a large extent since 1977. That's Netanyahu's natural coalition parties. Uh, what's going to be interesting this time is, again, you're going you're to have a situation where Netanyahu will win the election, but when he looks around at the parties around him, He's not going to see anybody because they're all anti-Bibi, because they think that it's time for him to go, that he's corrupt, whatever, that he's going to have trouble putting together enough parties to get over that 60 threshold. And then we're going to go back to the ele an election again. Now, what's happened over the last three times is every time you, you have an election, the, the Netanyahu, who's won two, two, two of those three elections outright, hasn't been able to form a coalition. So then we go back to another election. And then we think, oh, this time it'll be different, right? This time it'll be different. But why? What's going to be different? What's changed? You get the same people running. You get the same people voting, right? You just it, 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 There hasn't been any new ideology or any new personality that's emerged to make any change actually happen on the ground. Um, the, the coalition agreements, how do they work? The parties get together. They have to agree on certain fundamental things. Uh, and, you know, every side gives in a little bit are supposed to give in a little bit and they, they form a government. What happens in practice is they give in a little bit until they can, you know, until it doesn't work. And when it doesn't work, one party will pick an issue uh, upon which to, to bring down the government. And what's happened in the past is one of the, one of the issues has been over, over the Haredim, over Haredi enlistment. Should the, uh, you know, should the, the government force the Haredim to go into the army? Um, one party who's not Haredi in the coalition will say, hey, yeah, this is important to us. The Haredi will say, if you do that, we're going to leave the government. And that's brought down a couple of governments. So, so there's always one issue that becomes a stickler unless you have a strong enough coalition. Okay. Uh, and who do the, you mentioned the Russian and Ethiopian immigrants, uh, who do they uh, normally vote for? And I think uh, part of this question also I should add is, uh, how has that changed over time? Because these immigration waves, the Ethiopian wave, I think, has continued to some extent, but the, the major Russian immigration wave happened now 30 years ago. Uh, so I imagine the voting patterns might have shifted over time as well. Uh, well, look, in the 1990s, when the Russian immigrants came, uh, they voted towards the right, and they also voted for Russian parties, right? And, and Natan Sharansky had a party. Remember, Natan Sharansky had a party. Uh, which has since which has since uh, disappeared. A uh, Victor Lieberman, a uh, Victor Lieberman, who has been a, a, a kingmaker 
uh, over the last three elections, um, he's he's basing himself on on the Russian immigrants, right? He's a, he's a Russian immigrant party. Now, what, what's happened to to Lieberman? If 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 you follow the trajectory of his party, it's gone down in power over the years. And why has it gone down in power over the years? Because, like you said rightly, um, Russian immigrants when they first come into the country, right? They feel a need to vote for a party that they feel will represent them. So they vote for a Russian party. They don't speak Hebrew that well. They don't know what's going on. This party speaks Russian. The literature is Russian. They take them tours in Russian, right? They go for the Russian speakers. That's the first generation. The second generation, right? Their kids are Israelis. They don't need to vote for these parties. But we've seen that they still tend to vote towards the right. Um, Lieberman right now, his party, look, there's been something like a million, maybe 1.1 million Russian immigrants who's come into the country since since 1990. Um, 300,000 of them, maybe 350,000 of them, are not Jewish, right? I mean, they're not halakhically Jewish. They come in under the law of return, which states that if you have one Jewish grandparent, you can come into the country. So what we've seen is you have total families. You know, you have a, a husband and a wife, their kids, right? They're not Jewish, uh, they've got one Jewish grandfather who's Jewish, and they're able to come into the country. 300,000 of these. That's also a voting block. And this, I believe, is one of Lieberman's main constituency, right? He's going after these Russian non-Jews. Lieberman has turned, his party has turned into a very anti-Haredi party, anti-ultra-Orthodox party. I think it talks to these people who feel that the ultra-Orthodox have too much control over the country and that they feel left out because of it. So, so that's again, that's 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 the demographic. The, the Ethiopians, the Ethiopians also tend to vote towards the right. Uh, the Likud, they kind of view the Menachem Begin is the guy who you know who 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 started the change in how Israel looks at Ethiopian Jews. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of traditional affinity with Likud, and that's remained even through the generations. There, each party likes to get an Ethiopian uh, immigrant on their list, right, on their party list, believing that this will attract the Ethiopian immigrants. There's like 150,000 Ethiopian immigrants in the country, um, so it's not it's not a small it's not a small voting block. So if you can get you know if you can get an Ethiopian immigrant on your list, you can get you can track Ethiopian votes. That's that's something that help, helps the parties, which is why they. Believe there's a lot more Ethiopians in the Knesset than there are Americans in the Knesset, right? That's because the Ethiopians are seen as a, as a voting bloc. The Americans are not a voting bloc. Just to pick up something you mentioned about the about Lieberman's party today, uh, I was reading somewhere recently, and I can't remember uh, where, that there's there's a lot of, uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of anti-Haredi sentiment, let's say, at, at the moment, or a lot of strong feelings about how the lockdown has been and COVID restrictions have been enforced or not enforced in the Haredi community. Is that bolstering Lieberman? It's, it's yes, yes, yeah. It's, it's, it's bolstering Lieberman and it's bolstering merits, right? And it's, it's, it's bolstering Yesh Atid. Yesh Atid is a center left party uh, headed by gay, a guy named uh, Lapid, uh, Yair Lapid, who's ran about 10 years ago on an anti Haredi uh, platform. He's since kind of moderated his position because he realizes that without the Haredi, it's going to be very difficult to form a, to form a coalition. But I think one of the one of the casualties from this COVID, despite the fact that we're you know we've already lost four thousand five hundred people, one of the one of the casualties is the this 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 reemergence of the schism uh, between the Haredim and the general public. Um, it's it's uh, it's something that was actually receding. Uh, over over time, the Haredim started to integrate more into Israeli society. A lot of this, by the way, I, I attribute to Netanyahu. And Netanyahu was a finance minister in 2000, 2000, 2002. When he was in finance ministry, what he did was he cut the child allowances, which were a big part of the income for a lot of Haredi families. You know, for each kid, you get X amount of shekels. He cut that dramatically, forcing Haredi women and then a Haredi men to go into the workforce. This brought about a greater integration, right? The more Haredi are in the workforce, the more people get to know them. They, they realize, you know, they're just like us. They're just like everybody else. They're not, you know, they're not, uh, you know, with horns, whatever. And the Haredi see that the secular Israelis are not the devil. 
uh, it was leading to a greater integration. You started to see certain number of Haredim going to the army. COVID comes, right? And that puts a complete stop to this. As Israelis, Israelis, we've been in lockdown now for three weeks. So the Israeli, average secular Israeli sitting at home, he's got three kids, we're all at home, driving them crazy, you know, watching, doing, going to school on Zoom, right? Yeah, they're locked down, they're going nuts. And they look and they see that the Haredi community, right? Their kids are going to school. Their kids are going to school. And they say, why can their kid go to school? My kid can't go to school, right? Why is Ben Gurion Airport now closed and the Haredi are continuing to daven in Minyani, right? And so this creates a huge degree of, 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 of resentment uh, that's boiling over. And it's something that's, uh, that the country's going to have to deal with afterwards, right? This is, this is a huge issue. What COVID has done is it's, it's kind of uncovered the degree to which there are certain autonomous areas inside Israel where, where, there, where, where communities or certain parts of the community, because it's not fair to say al Haredim, because it's not al Haredim, it's a small minority of Haredim. But that's what people see on the television. That's what causes the, that, that, that's what causes the resentment. This idea that rules don't apply to everybody, that, that, that the law is not applied evenly. There's nothing that creates more frustration and resentment than the idea that the rule applies to me, but not to the guy down the street for whatever reason. And, and that's something this COVID has, uh, has, has revealed, and, and it's bad. It's bad. And it's happening at a time now when we're in an election, right? And what happens in an election? In an election, elections are built on the negative. Elections are built on sowing fear of the other. Elections are built on, 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 on disunity. And so you have that toxic ingredient at play in the elections, right? These parties will be pointing to the Haredim and saying, look, you know, let's get them out of power, these nasty Haredim. Uh, and again, there's a small minority of the Haredim who, who just are acting, acting in a way that, 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 that gets your blood boiling. But it's not everybody. It's a dangerous thing. And uh, unfortunately, it's, it's happening right in an election campaign where these parties are going to latch onto it and run with it. Uh, for the last question, I know it, it's getting late here and it's much later for you uh, there. So we'll, we'll finish with uh, uh, sort of two final questions that are related to Iran. Uh, how do Israelis, how are Israelis thinking about, how do they feel about the fact that Biden has talked about rejoining the uh, Iran nuclear deal? Uh, and related to that, perhaps on a more helpful note, um, someone pointed out that they recently read an article either in the Jerusalem Post or Times of Israel, uh, in which an Iranian cleric was interviewed uh, and talked about the possibility of peace between Iran and, and Israel in the future. Uh, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Um, look, as far as how Israelis see the Iranian thing, you know, Israelis are divided. We're divided people, right? We're divided now over Netanyahu. Uh, one thing that most Israelis can concur with, and now you're seeing it kind of across the board in the political spectrum and in the military, in the intelligence spectrum, is that the Iranian nuclear deal was a bad deal. Why was it a bad deal? It was a bad deal because it didn't toss the Iranian nuclear program out the window. It just kicked it down the road for 15 years, right? So it was signed in 2015. By 2030, a lot of the clauses keeping the Iranians from moving forward were to be taken off. We're already at 2021, right? And we hope to be here in 2030. So in 2030, if all this stuff is taken off, the Iranian ideology ain't going to change by then. So we're stuck again. We're stuck, but we're stuck in a worse position because then Iran will have all the legitimacy to, 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 to do what it takes to, uh, to build a nuclear weapon. So there's, there's, there's uh, to a certain, as much as you can get a consensus in Israel, right? There is a consensus in Israel that the Iranian nuclear deal is a bad deal. And there would be a mistake for Biden to go rushing back into it. Now there's concern that because Biden to a large extent has surrounded himself with people who were responsible for the deal, right? Anthony Blinken, uh, Jake Sullivan, Wendy Sherman, these are people who's, who signed off on this deal. Um, they're going to want to, the, the concern is that well, they're not going to say, hey, they're not going to look at the reality of the last five years and see everything that Iran has done uh, malevolently in the region and say, hey, we goofed. Right? It's very difficult for somebody to admit you know, a, a mistake of that dimension. So the concern is that they will want to go back into the agreement without, without strengthening it, without changing the Iranian behavior. So there is concern about that. But one thing that's changed here, right, 
and I think is a big difference, is that if you go back to under the Obama years, when Netanyahu kind of stood up alone and frontally confronted the president of the United States, this year when he does it, and it ain't going to be alone, right? Uh, because of the accords with the UAE and with Bahrain and with the Persian Gulf, because of the understandings, the silent understandings what they have with the Saudis, there will be kind of a joint message coming from both Israel and the Persian Gulf that to do this would be bad, or you have to you have to change it. You have to you have to change the way it was done, uh, and that's different because because if you come at it, it's not only Israel against this deal but it's Israel and the Persian Gulf against this deal, then you might have people in Washington say, hey, you know what, maybe, you know, they, they might have something. They might have something. So, so that's, that's something, you know, that's changed and that's, that's positive. As far as, the, as, far as the, the other question about the Iranian cleric, I would love to end this talk on a positive note and saying, yes, yes, things are changing in Iran. This cleric speaks for the people. We're gonna have peace with the Iranians. Uh, I don't see that as happening. Look, we did have peace with Iranians up until 1979. We had great relations with Iran. We got our oil from Iran. Israelis went to Iran. That changed with Khomeini, right? Uh, and, and the Ayatollahs. And the Ayatollahs and Khomeini are completely in charge, right? This, this voice of this cleric, that's a nice voice. It's a, it's, it's a lone call deep, 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 deep out, deep in the wilderness. The opposition to Israel, right? Uh, the, 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 the exportation of the Islamic uh, jihad, the, the Islamic revolution, right? That is the mahout, that is the substance of this Iranian regime. If they give that up, they give up everything, right? They give up the core of their ideology. It's like saying you know, Israel's, gonna, Israel's giving up on the belief that, the, that Jerusalem is its capital. They can't do that, they would lose their identity. So as long as this regime is in power, right, I don't see any change. Question is, is this regime going to, going to remain in power forever, right? Uh, I mean, hopefully not. They've been there since 1979. Uh, the Soviets fell at a certain point. Um, they all fall too at a certain point. Uh, I think Israel was, was pleased with the, with, the, you know, with, with the pressure that America was putting in on Iran in the hope that this would lead to something happening inside Iran that would eventually force the Ayatollahs out. Uh, Biden might change that policy. If, if, if he does, that's something that Israel will obviously you know, not look favorably on. Can Israel make peace with the Iranian people, right, with the Persians? Definitely. We were there before. Can it make peace with this regime, with these Ayatollahs? Very, 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 very unlikely, despite what one, one or two clerks might say. Okay, so I, think I wish I could leave on a positive note. <laughs> well, well, we'll hold on to that memory of, of like you said, that, that there was peace before uh, 1979, before the Islamic Revolution, and, and God willing, we'll, it will be something that will reach again uh, in the future. The, the positive note is, look what's going on around us. I mean, who would have thought we'd have the peace now with the Persian Gulf, with Morocco, with Sudan? So things change. But there, it's an ideological core of their identity. There, I, I find it very difficult to believe. Um, but thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. Uh, it was you. really a pleasure to, uh, to have you and, uh, and to, for you to uh, explain so much about what's going on uh, in this election, the dynamics of this election to, to all of us. Uh, I'm going to end the recording now. Um,